Here's where we're going to start uh, this, this morning. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, this series is entitled, Give Us a King. And so what I want to do this morning is I just want to set up a little bit and give you a little bit of context of, about the book of 1 Samuel because I don't want to take, uh, take for granted that some of you uh, may know this, um, some of you may not. And so I just want to do that as we kick off a, a, a series walking through this book that we make sure we understand where we're at in God's word because we're, we're jumping in uh, into his story. So in 1 Samuel chapter, in 1 Samuel in this book, really what you need to understand first of all is if you were to look uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, 1 and 2 Samuel is actually one book, okay? It's just broken up into two books uh, in our English. But 1 Samuel, here's what we find first of all. We find three primary characters in this uh, book, in this story, uh, and those being Samuel, that being Saul, who's the first king, and then, of course, we're most familiar with, with David. Most scholars believe that Samuel actually was the author, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of 1 Samuel. There's no concrete evidence of that because it doesn't say, like we often find in our epistles in the New Testament, it's very clear who wrote uh, each book. But, but most scholars believe that, that Samuel was the one who wrote 1 Samuel until chapter 25 where we find Samuel die. And then you have the prophet Nathan and the prophet Gad continue to continue that writing all the way through the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, the book of 1 Samuel is written about 1050 B.C., okay, so about 3,000 years ago. Uh, 200 years have taken place from the time that Joshua leads the people of Israel into the promised land. 200 years have taken place to where we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 1. I think, I think that may be a curious uh, fact for some of you. But here's what we also need to understand. It was a time of leadership crisis. Uh, we know in the book of Judges, we did that series a couple years ago, and, and in some places, man, we were wading deep up to our necks in the book of Judges. The book of Judges ha had some really uh, ugly, nasty uh, parts as we walk through that. And if you remember in Judges 21, what does it say? That every person in Israel did what was right in his own eyes. And so where we find ourselves in 1 Samuel is a leadership crisis. Israel at this time is still being ruled by judges, but what we will find is, is that there comes a point where Israel longs to be like every other nation. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 8, they t say to Samuel, who was functioning as the judge at the time, they say, Samuel, we want a human king. We want to be like other nations, because up to this point, in, sp in spite of the dysfunction, in spite of the judges who were designed by God to be his spokesmen for the people of Israel, despite them not doing their job and the dysfunction and the sin that was going on in Israel, God was set up as their king. But what we're going to find is, is Israel isn't satisfied with that. They want a human king. And they say in 1 Samuel chapter 8 these words, give us a king. It's where we get the title of this series. See, here's what we need to understand this morning. Just as we set up this series, we're all looking for a guide in life. Every one of us. Every one of us are looking for someone who can lead us to a place of joy, to a place of fulfillment. All of us want that. It's not a bad thing to want. So what do we find ourselves doing? Well, we look for a friendship, we look for a spouse, we look to a job, we look to maybe even our favorite talking head that oftentimes is the preacher that we listen to more than anyone that you hear up on stage here on Sunday morning if Salem Chapel is your home. Got election coming up in two days, probably nobody needed to be reminded of that. Who else is looking forward to not seeing ads anymore on their YouTube and on their TV? Yeah, me, me as well. We look to politicians, and listen, there's nothing wrong. I want you to vote. I think it's a, it's a thing that we have been given by God to do, to steward. This is our country. I hope that whether literally or figuratively, you have taken your ballot and you've taken your Bible and you said, okay, God, what do I need to do? I think that's a good thing, but my point is this. We're all looking for a guide. And as Aaron said to set up communion, we're all looking for a king 
But oftentimes the king that we want is not the king that we need. And so over the next 16 weeks, four months, like we're going to be in this for a while, for the next four months, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look throughout this book, and though we won't be able to have time to deal with every single word and every single verse in detail, or we'd be in this book a lot longer than 16 weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the mistakes that the children of Israel made. These are all fallen people, and longing for a king that they already had, and how we so often make mistakes and experience different things in our life and lose track of the reality, me included, because we're looking to a king that cannot fulfill what our greatest heart's desires are. So 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses all the way through chapter 2, verse 11 is where we're going to spend our time this morning. And, and just that chunk of scripture should validate what I just said. We're not going to have time to deal with every single verse. So hopefully, if you haven't already downloaded this or you have this, you've gone to our website. We have these at the Welcome Center. It's a reading plan that allows you to read ahead. So if you've already been following along in this, you've already read this passage of scripture before you came today. So I want to encourage you to do that so that God can reveal to you the, what he wants wants to say to you as you read his word throughout the week. And we hope that you'll use our Bible reading tool. And if you have another way to read God's word, that you do that. But I hope that you do that. But I want to start in verses 1 through 10. So let's just read these 10 verses. Verse 1 says, There was a certain man of Ramathim, Sophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. Now, don't let that sidetrack you because we'll speak about that in a second, okay? So don't, don't like all of a sudden wander off into whatever you're thinking about having two wives and was that supposed to be? Was that not supposed to be? So you just can pay attention to me? It's not supposed to be, okay? Let's move on. The name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, which is just north of Jerusalem. So Shiloh at the time was the place where the tabernacle was, where the son, two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. And as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10 is where I want us to just concentrate here for a moment, where it says that Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Here's the title of the message this morning, The Grace of the Desperate Place. And here's the idea that I want you to get today. That your desperate place, right now, what is it? Because your desperate place is an opportunity for you, for me, to experience God's grace. Your desperate place today is an opportunity to experience God's place. See, Hannah's name means grace. Grace. If you look at it in the Hebrew, it actually means grace. But as we've already read in through verse 10, what grace did Hannah know? I mean, if we're reading this, and I would look at this and say, what grace did Hannah know? Let's just reflect on what she was experienced. Elkanah had two wives. That was not something that God designed, but we see that all over the Old Testament. People having wives. 
two wives, three wives, whatever it is. It's not that God ordained that. The reason why we know God didn't say, hey, Adam, I'm going to take two or three of your ribs so you could have two or three of the wives. Took one rib, one wife. But what we see is the order of the wives' name in this passage and what we even see how, how Elkanah responded to Hannah versus Penina that suggests that Hannah was Elkanah's first wife. So unfortunately, what would happen is, is that if, if someone married a woman and she could not get pregnant, then what they would do to carry on their line is they would find someone else, they would marry someone else, and they would produce, hopefully, children for them. Hopefully, they didn't have to go too long along the chain, but, but nevertheless, I mean, this just shows you, back to Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I mean, basically, Penina was to Elkanah just a means to an end. But he loved Hannah. And the new wife, Penina, oh, bore him many children. It says that she had sons and she had daughters. But what did Penina do? She constantly provoked Hannah. I mean, you see that all over the Old Testament with multiple wives, and it's nothing against the, the women. By no means, don't get me wrong in this, but what did that do? That always created dysfunction and jealousy, and you see this going back and forth, that not only did Hannah have to deal with mourning the reality that she could not produce children and get pregnant, but she then had to deal with the chastisement of the woman that her husband that she loved took and a constant reminder of what she couldn't do, and then Penina reminded her about it all the time. Why do I mention these things and highlight these things? Because we can look at that and say, what grace did Hannah know? Like her life is full of turmoil, struggling internally with what she doesn't have, being reminded by it by a woman that won't let her forget it, having to sit around that day after day after day, my point is this, Hannah found herself in a desperate place. And so I ask you again this morning, before we unpack this lengthy passage of Scripture, where is your desperate place today? And how are you struggling to see God's grace in that place? Where is it? Because what I want you to know today is this, that God will use those desperate places as an opportunity for you to experience his grace. And so what I wanna do with the rest of our time this morning is I wanna give you, answer this question, how do you, how do I experience God's grace in our desperate place? And I want through this passage of scripture to see three ways that the Lord gives us instruction on how we can experience his grace in that place. But before I do, I just want us to take a moment and I want us to pray. And I want you to think about your desperate place. And I want you just to say, Lord, would you allow me to see in your word how I need to respond in this place that I'm in. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, I thank you today, Lord, for the opportunity to open up your word and to receive what you want us to see, what you want us to hear, and how you want us to respond. And so Lord, we don't need to pray that you'll speak because that's what you promised to do through your Holy Spirit. But Lord, may we have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to respond to what you will say. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's my tension that I've lived in all week, and just going to be transparent, is I know so many people that are in a desperate place in this room as I look out, people that aren't in this room that are in a desperate place. And I think so often when we go to God's word and we sit and we listen to a sermon as we can approach it so formulaic. Uh, give me three points that I can plug and play, and in a matter of moments, I'll see the results. We almost view oftentimes church as a sitcom, a 30-minute sitcom, that there's a problem that's presented, and then by the end of the 30 minutes, it's resolved. And I don't need to tell you this, but life's not like that. 
Life's not like that. And so I don't want you, as we walk through this, to approach this in a formulaic way, because if you do, you'll just walk away disenchanted, jaded, and frustrated. But I want us to look at God's word in a way, not formulaically, if that's even a word, but to look at God's word in a way that says, Lord, I need you to strengthen my faith. And so I want to encourage you that. But here's the first way that we experience God's grace in the desperate place. It's found in verses 1 all the way through verse 18 in this passage of Scripture. Here it is. Number one, you pour out your soul's sorrow in exchange for God's peace. I mean, that's exactly what Hannah does in this passage of Scripture. It says in verse 10, once again, she was deeply distressed and she prayed to the Lord bitterly. That word deeply distressed and bitterly literally means the bitterness of soul. It's speaking to her deep emotional pain. And I'm not remiss or naive enough to say that even in a crowd this size, we may have women in this room that long nothing, want nothing more than to conceive a child. You can relate to this. But like I said, it may not be wanting to conceive a child this morning. It could be something else. And you would say, that's exactly how I feel. Man, I have a bitterness of soul. I have emotional pain that cannot be described. But what's interesting is this Hebrew phrase, every time it's used in the Old Testament, It's used in such a way to where the relief of this deep emotional pain can't come from a human being. That every time you see this phrase, it is only divine intervention from the Lord that is the remedy. And I think that's significant this morning. Because if you've been ever experiencing deep emotional pain, you've tried to look at a human remedy. You've tried to look to a physical king. And you've come to the place that even though you've tried to do that, and I don't even mean in a sinful way, but that's our nature. We've tried to look for ways to absolve ourselves from this. Oftentimes, when we're in a desperate place, we come quick to the realization that, Lord, if you don't intervene, I don't know how. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get out of this, whatever the case may be. In verse 11, it says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you'll indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I'll give to him to, to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. We'll unpack the rest of these verses here in a moment, but I want you to see that Hannah knew where to take her sorrow and anxiety. She knew where to take it. You don't see her taking it to Elkanah, though I know that she probably did that many times. I mean, she was human. Let's not forget, these aren't characters void of emotion. I'm sure she took it to Hannah. Remember, she had to deal with Penina reminding her about it all the time. She was disappointed. She was dissatisfied. She was discontent with her circumstances. But she knew where to take it. I don't know if you noticed this, but it probably jumped out to you when you were reading it maybe this week or when I just read it. Verse 5 says, the Lord closed her womb. And you're like, how do I reconcile that? But we've got to remind ourselves that Hannah's not writing this, first of all. And this is reflecting back on what already happened. So there's perspective there as Samuel writes this about his own mother that he looks and says, okay, it's not that the Lord caused caused this because as we looked at the last series, we weren't created to know evil. The things that we experience in this world when it comes to our health, when it comes to conceiving, when it comes to disease, when it comes to evil that's done to us or that we do to others, it's a result of sin in this world. Lord didn't cause that. But what Samuel is doing is he's reflecting, saying, ah, I just want to point out that the Lord used this, and he didn't waste it, but he used this situation to teach my mother something. And I just want to emphasize that, because some of you may have read this and be like, how do I reconcile that? That's the idea of the Lord closed her womb. But what grounded her in the midst of this sorrow? And what grounded her? I think what we see as she prays out this vow here is that the faith that she had in the Lord and his power and his desire to work out 
his good on her behalf is what kept her grounded. Lord, I believe in your power, and I believe in your desire to want to work this out for your good. I just mentioned Hannah prayed a vow. And oftentimes we can be like, well, was that right to do? Because we can misunderstand as though, as though Hannah was bargaining with God. Like literally saying to God, God, I'll do this if you do this. But that wasn't her heart at all in the vow. And here's why I say that. She poured out her sorrow to God in the following ways in this prayer. Let me give you these ways to you that I think that can be helpful to us as we try to understand, man, what do I do in my desperate place? How do I experience God's peace? We said, man, we need to pour out our sorrow to God, not hold it in, but give it to him. Be real with him. Hannah does this. How does she pour out her sorrow to God? How do you and I do that? Well, here's the first way. We pour out our sorrow with confidence in God's character. Why do I say that? Because she calls the Lord the Lord of hosts in verse 11. It's the first time it's ever mentioned in the Old Testament up to this point. And the Lord of hosts actually refers to God's power and his authority. This is the name of God that she uses. First time it's ever mentioned in the Old Testament. It's Jehovah Sabbath. She says, Lord, as I'm pouring out my sorrow, my deep emotional pain, here's what I know. You are Jehovah Sabbath. You have power and you have authority to work in this situation. Here's the second thing that she does that I think we can glean. Man, how do we pour out our sorrow to God? How did she? We pour out our sorrow with a consciousness of who we are. Who we are. Why do I say that? Because three times in verse 11, she refers to herself as servant. Not in a demeaning way, but in a way understanding, God, I understand who you are. Jehovah Sabbath. I understand. I'm reminding myself of your character. I've got to do that because my sorrow and my anxiety is heavy. Year after year, she's going to the temple, and I'm sure praying, or the tabernacle, I'm praying this. But she also says, Lord, I also understand who I am. We're not deserving of anything. But Lord, you're my God, and I'm your servant. Here's the third thing that she does that I think we need to do as well. We pour out our sorrow, calling on God to intervene. Jesus says what in the Sermon on the Mount? Ask, seek, and knock over and over again. She asked God for what she deeply desired. And sometimes, I don't know, depending on our past or whatever it is or, 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 or whatever the circumstances may be, we can sometimes feel guilty to cry out to God for what we desire. And if that's you, can I just put that guilt away for you? Can God's word put it away for you? Because Hannah does exactly that. She pours out her sorrow, calling on God to do it. And she does it so passionately that in this passage of Scripture, Eli thinks she's wasted. But you know what I love that she does? She says, no, 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 no. She says, no, my Lord, verse 15, I'm a woman who's troubled in spirit. I've not drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. With confidence in, your, in God's character, with a consciousness of who I am, and with understanding that the Lord wants me to call on him to enter and what's Eli's response to her? Can we all read it together? Verse 17, those three words, I'm gonna give you three words unless we're confused this morning, go in peace, okay? That's what we're gonna read together. Verse 17, then Eli answered, go in peace. Say it one more time, go in peace. Can I just give you a principle that we need to remind ourselves this morning? Prayer changes the prayer. There's been so many times in my life where I'm like, I have been praying for this situation. There's situations right now in our church that I have been pounding heaven's door, and so many of us have. 
And it's easy to sometimes get jaded and say, well, what's the use? Because prayer changes the prayer. It changes me. It reminds me of who God is. It reminds me of who I am. It reminds me of the importance of continuing to call on God to intervene in my desperate place. What I want you to see, first of all, in these verses is that Hannah's circumstances didn't change. Where we find ourselves in verses 1 through 18, it's so easy to be like, oh, it changed. We, fought, we, we know the ending of the story. Hannah didn't. When Eli says, go in peace, and then in verse 18, and she says, or at the end it says, then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Hannah's circumstances didn't change, but her perspective changed. And it was her perspective that gave her peace. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, we know this passage so well. Where Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. You know, so often in my life, I can look at that phrase and I can view it as condemnation. Johnny, don't be anxious about anything. You're anxious? Don't be anxious about anything. But that's not the heart of it at all. This is the heart of God for you this morning. Susie, Johnny, Matt, Andy, Tim, Karen, come to me. I don't want you to be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer, and that word supplication means your needs. By prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let them be known to me. And what's the result? And the peace that surpasses all understanding, that doesn't make sense, that peace that in the midst of your desperate place, you should be freaking out. And there's times that we do because we're fallen people, but there's also times where God just wants to pour out his peace as we pour out his sorrow. And what does that peace do? It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Hannah came to the Lord with her sorrow, but she left with his peace. Here's the second way we experience God's grace in our desperate place. It's found in verses 19 through 28. You surrender the timeline of your petitions in exchange for the hope of God's provision. You surrender the timeline of your petitions in exchange for the hope of of God's provision. Look at verse 19. It says, they rose early in the morning, they worshiped before the Lord, then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Here's the key. I have this underlined in my Bible, and in due time. Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked him for the Lord. But I love the wording in verse 20, and in due time. And in due time. You surrender the timeline of your petitions, our petitions, in exchange for the hope of God's provision. See, here's what the hope of God's provision tells you and tells me. That God's paying attention to you in your desperate place. Because as we're pouring out our heart before the Lord and our sorrow before the Lord and we're in that desperate place, it is so easy for me. Let me just speak to me. It is so easy for me to get caught up into believing. Remember, the devil distracts, he deceives, he discourages, and he divides. Those are his tactics. He can so easily deceive me that because the Lord has not delivered me out of this desperate place that I'm in, that somehow I can believe that he is not paying attention to what is going on. I don't have time to give you all the stories where I could unpack how the Lord has shown me that. I just want you to understand that if that's you this morning, I want you to understand that I've been there. And why do I say that God is paying attention to you in your desperate place? Because that word remember, at the end of verse 19, the Lord remembered her, literally means in the Hebrew to pay attention. 
pay attention. And that word is used before Hannah conceives. So what that tells you and that tells me is the Lord was paying attention to Hannah before the Lord provided her a child. The Lord was paying attention to Hannah when Penina was literally irritating and antagonizing her over and over and beating her down and reminding her of what what she knew to be true. The Lord remembered her then. The Lord remembered her as she was journeying up to the tabernacle every year and being reminded, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to pour out my heart before the Lord and I'm going to go back home and I'm going to feel down and I'm going to feel discouraged and I'm going to have to live with the woman that reminds me of what I don't have. No, no, the Lord remembered her then. The Lord remembered her. She's pouring out her heart so much that Eli thinks she's drunk. The Lord remembered her. See, we want to sometimes equate the Lord remembering us, paying attention to us when he delivers the way that we're praying. But what we need to remind ourselves is the Lord is paying attention to you right now in the middle of your desperate place. See, the Lord's, I wrote this down, the Lord's care for me and presence with me in the desperate place is as much his provision as deliverance from the desert place. Lord, help me to experience your peace right now. So I'm pouring out my sorrow, but at the same time as I'm pouring out my sorrow, Lord, let me surrender my timeline. And as I surrender my timeline, I do it with the understanding that, Lord, I have hope that I don't know how you're going to provide, but I know you're going to provide because you're good. And you're paying attention to me. You see it. Here's what else the hope of God's provision tells us. And I see this with Hannah as well. That God has, is, and and will work out the good from your desperate place. Why do I say that? Because when she actually births a son, what does she name him? Samuel. God didn't tell her what to name her child. This wasn't like Mary with Jesus. God didn't tell Hannah, what to name her child, but she names him Samuel, which literally means God has heard. And the name of her son testifies to the truth that, Lord, I always believed, though I didn't know how, though I didn't know if you were going to do it the way that I wanted or ever give me a child, but, Lord, here's what I know, that you have, you are, and you will work out the good from this desperate place. Here's the third thing the hope of God's provision tells you and tells me that, man, I need to be reminded today, and maybe you do as well, that God is trustworthy to take care of what is most precious to you. That desire right now for you, if you're in that desperate place and he he hasn't delivered you out of that or he's walking you through that, What's most precious to you is that desire for God to intervene in the way that you want. Yeah. But for Hannah at this point, you know what was most precious to her? It was that baby boy that she longed for. And why do I say God is trustworthy to take care of what is most precious to you? Because look at Alcana, the daddy's reaction to giving Samuel to the Lord's service because that's what she does with this vow. Lord, I will give him back to you in the Lord, and, and he will serve in the tabernacle and, and, and all of the days of his life. That's a, that's a tremendous promise that Hannah is making. But look at Elkanah's reaction because here's what's happened up to this place. He's going to worship in the temple and Hannah is staying back and she's not giving Samuel while he's still a baby. She's nursing him and when he's done being nursed and when that time is done, then she will take him. We'll talk about that here in a second. But I want you to first of all see Elkanah's response as Hannah tells him the plan. You know what he says in verse 23? Look at it. He says, only may the Lord establish his word. It's the idea that, yep, Hannah, we prayed this. So I am asking the Lord to protect our son. I'm going to allow and allow myself and bring myself to the place where I'm believing that God is trustworthy to take care of what is precious. But look at 
Verses 22 and 23, when Hannah talks about, well, I'm going to nurse this child. Here goes back to this whole idea where we read this and we know the ending of the story and we gloss over so many things that make these people not human. Most Hebrew women would nurse their children up to two, possibly three years. Right, up to three years of age. Some of you women are like, I can't imagine that. But nevertheless, that was kind of what they, what, that was the normal practice. So think, every time that Hannah holds her son and is nursing her son, and probably counting down the days when Samuel is not going to be with her every moment. Think of, I'll, I'll just testify like if I'm the dad thinking to myself, well, did we really mean that prayer? Well, maybe, maybe we can still have him to the Lord's service and still give him to that, but he, but he doesn't have to go to the tabernacle. You start rationalizing all these things in your mind, right? Because at the end of the day, you're like, no, 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 this is something that's precious to me, and I'm struggling to believe that God is trustworthy to take care of what is most precious to me. But Hannah gave to the Lord what God had given her. Because in verse 24, what does she do when she finally shows up and that nursing time is over and she's there with her little boy, probably four years old. Can you imagine? I cannot. And she gives this sacrifice to the Lord. And what does it say in verse 24? She, she sacrifices, a, they sacrifice a bull, flour, and wine. And that was symbolic that if you were fulfilling a vow, that's what you would sacrifice. That's why those three things are mentioned. But it's interesting that she even gave more than what was required. Because she, going in this in this desperate place and through this desperate place, man, it allowed her to grow in understanding the hope that is found in a God who provides. And look at verse 27. She says, for this child I prayed, and the Lord granted me my petition that I have made to him. Verse 28, therefore I have lent. That word lent literally means given. Therefore, I have lent or given him to the Lord, and as long as he lives, he is lent or given to the Lord, and he worshiped there. What a great passage of scripture, by the way, for how how we ought to respond and act with the children that God has given us. That's a completely different message. But here's just what I want you to see under these verses of 19 through 28, that the motivation to surrender our timelines to the Lord is anchored in the hope The hope of what God can do. And once again, let's not approach this formulaic. What I just said feels impossible often. More times than not. But it's the faith that's anchored not in what I feel, but what I I know. And let me give you the third thing and we'll be done. How do we experience God's grace? In our desperate place, oh, I see this in Hannah's prayer in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I mean, we could do a whole series on these 10 verses. But we've got to abandon our pragmatic plans in exchange for prayers of dependency. I'm so guilty of this. When I run into a problem especially a desperate one. I am immediately in my mind calculating all the scenarios. I've got a plan A, I've got a plan B, I've got a plan C. I automatically go into that mode. Why? Because I'm afraid. And I've shared with you before, how do I respond to field? Man, I go into hyper control mode. But in this prayer that we're gonna read here in a moment, I see Hannah's prayers of dependency. Because she was put in a desperate place that had no pragmatic way of getting out. There was no infertility medicine back then. There was no shots to take. There was none of these things. But the Lord was doing something in Hannah. He was allowing her to grow and to experience that her desperate place was an opportunity to experience God's Grace.
Let me read verses 1 through 10. Let's just read this and allow God's word to speak to us. And notice the prayers of dependency that are found. Now, most people aren't sure when Hannah prayed this. Did she pray this before she was given Samuel? Or was she pray, did she pray this after the Lord blessed her with child? We're not sure, but nevertheless, what an amazing prayer. Listen to what she says. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn, that horn means my strength, is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides by enemies. Most likely she's speaking of Penina who's constantly at her. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Lord, I understand your character. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not your arrogance come for your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bowels of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Do you see there? No, no, no. It's not about my plan. It's not about how I can fix it. It's not about who I am. No, no, no. Who experiences the grace of God? The feeble. Feeble. Those who are full have hired out for themselves bread. But look at this. But those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. So often in my life, it's that desperate place that the Lord wants to bring me to a place where I'm like, Lord, I have tried to be satisfied on everything else. And Lord, you've brought me to a place where my hunger is for you. Because it's in my hunger that God's grace is experienced in the desperate place. The barren have, has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. That's for sure, Penina. Penina. The Lord kills and brings life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings the low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with the princes and inherit a seed of honor. From the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Now what I love here, here's a promise of Jesus. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Even in the midst of this prayer, Hannah prophesies that there is coming a king there's coming a king who will deliver us and we can look forward because of this king's deliverance to a place, as we talked about in the last series, where there will no longer be any desperate places. See, when we look at this passage of scripture, as much as we're looking at how Hannah responded, it brings me to a place of Jesus being our ultimate example. I think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane his most desperate place. And what does he do? He pours out his sorrow. He surrenders his timeline. He prays prayers of dependency. See, often our desire to run to ways to fix the situation, solve the situation, strategize about the situation can be misplaced energy that cause us to miss the invitation from God to run to him. You know how the Lord spoke to me one of the ways he spoke to me in this passage of scripture this week? Is I was like, man, Lord, so often I'm so pragmatic and I need to exchange the whiteboard of strategy and self-sufficiency for prayers of dependency. This is on the screen. I want to read it to you. I wrote these thoughts down as we close. God is not going to lead you to or through a place where you won't need to rely on his grace. That's not how God works. God's never going to lead you at a place where you're like, God, I don't really need you. Because God is fully committed for you and for me to understand more fully 
So as God is fully committed in your desperate place to give you his grace, to show you his love, and to work out the evil in exchange for his good. You know what that reminds me of? Romans 8, 28, and following. It's on the screen. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I want to emphasize this, because, but not because I don't think you know it, but because we need to be reminded. All things are not good. And I wish that that good that God is working would always be what I want it to be. Sometimes it's not. But that doesn't cause us, remind us, of us to call out for what we desire But what does verse 31 say? What then shall we say to these things? And me having the assurance that God's going to provide, that God's going to bring peace, that God's going to grow me in his grace. What shall I say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 35, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here's what I want to do in the time that we have left is I just want us in this place for there just to be quiet. The keyboard can play in the background if it wants. But I just want us to take whatever we have, whatever desperate place it is, and I just want us to take it to the Lord right now, just you and him. Pour it out. Pour it out this week. Pour it out later today. Pour it out tomorrow. He wants you to pour it out to him. Say, Lord, I'm pouring it out. I want to experience your peace. Maybe you need to surrender your timeline. But surrender it with the hope that God is good, that God always provides. Here's what I know, definitely, prayers of dependency. Put the figurative whiteboard away and call out to him. Listen, you may be here today and you're not in a desperate place. And man, praise God for that. But I know that there's many that are. We've highlighted, we've got the family, the Cochran's, they've got a little boy who's been in a hospital for a month, no idea what's wrong with him. Call out to God for them. And I don't say that to minimize what anybody else may be going through. If you know someone else is going through something, then call out to God for them. Call out to God in your desperate place for you, whatever it is, but let's just pray to him right now. Let's call out to him. And then I'm going to pray to close this, but I want us to give us space this morning to do this. Because we have a king. Let's go to him. I so often want to run from the desperate place. But Lord, as we've seen from your word today, the desperate place is an opportunity to experience your grace in a greater way. Lord, help us not to run from the wrestling. 
But I pray for every person in this room. And I've been doing this long enough to know that the vast majority of the people in this room are in it some sort of desperate place. There may be some that some could equate it more desperate than others, but nevertheless, Lord, it is that person's desperate place. And so, Lord, I thank you that you do not weigh one place over the next and say, well, I'm taking time to intervene in this one. You wait. Lord, you are big enough to deal with every situation. So, Lord, we pour out our sorrow to you. We surrender our timelines to you. We put away our pragmatic plans and ways, and we play prayers of dependency. Lord, we thank you that you showed us perfectly what that looks like. Lord, we need a king, but it's not a human king. It's our savior king. And Lord, we're gonna sing a song here that we know so well for you to be the king of our heart. And I keep thinking when we get to that line that you are good, there's so many people that are struggling right now to believe that, to sing that, to say that. But God, let us say it in faith for what will be, not maybe what is. So God, may this song just solidify, Lord, what we have just prayed and what we will pray today, tomorrow, and the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning?